Welcome everybody to the CRISP speaker series on privacy. It's our pleasure today to have Glencora Bordale from Oregon State University. Glencora uh, has a connection to Waterloo. They did a uh, postdoc here in, uh, in actually the CNO department uh, doing graph theory. Uh, but recently they have uh, changed their research focus to privacy enhancing technologies, particularly uh, in order to aid at-risk groups who may be under surveillance. And uh, this is of course uh, an exciting topic uh, for us here in the speaker series. And so we're uh, very pleased to have uh, Professor Borodale. Please go Thank ahead. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. It was nice to see some familiar names in the participant list. So hello to everybody. Um, I am happy to take questions during through the Q&A function. Um, I might leave sort of longer answer questions to the end, uh, but if there are brief clarification questions, I'll try to keep an eye on the Q&A bar um, and I'll try to leave time at the end to have more in-depth questions. I'm going to start today by giving a very short and incomplete history of surveillance of, in particular, U.S. activist movements, starting with the Red Scare. Um, I want to do this, uh, you know, I, I, I probably don't need to tell this crowd why privacy is needed, uh, but I want to tell you where I'm coming from in my research. Um, so, uh, in the 1920s through 50s, communist and social worker movements focused on uniting workers across industrial divisions, as well as across race divisions, and did at the time uh, quite uniquely engage in explicitly anti-racist organizing. Uh, these organizing communities felt the brunt of McCarthyism, the government's suppression of communism through FBI's Komen Phil program, uh, which was an FBI program that used extreme tactics to infiltrate and suppress communist movements, and also had requirements such as uh, requiring government workers to disavow communism. Um, and this is something that we actually see in the present day in the US. For example, in te Texas, we've recently seen government workers being required to disavow the boycott, divest, and sanction movement that is in support of a free Palestine. The much more famous COINTEL program was, grew out of the COINTEL program and had a greater scope in terms of the tactics it used, uh, as well as the movements that were targeted. But COINTEL Pro did grow out from um, initially focusing on movements that had overlap with communist movements. And this document shown here is one of the first that came to light of COINTEL Pro and reflects one major intent of, uh, of COINTELPRO, that they were looking to um, create this, this idea of uh, conspicuous surveillance, that there was an FBI agent behind every mailbox. They wanted social movements to know that they were being surveilled to try to impart a chilling effect on those social movements to have them not engage in the activism that they were engaging in. Um, and I do encourage uh, uh, people to look at uh, primary documents because there's some hilarious uh, uh, comments, maybe not hilarious, but comments that are very telling of, for, in this example, the FBI's view of itself. Um, at the bottom of the slide, too, too hard for you to read probably, but it says that um, some targets of the FBI will be overcome by the overwhelming personalities of the contacting agent and will volunteer to tell all. Um, so the FBI had quite a high view of itself at the time. Uh, COINTELPRO largely focused its efforts on leftist movements, and this is, this is in the sort of late 60s through 70s, uh, with a large lens on the movements of and growing from the civil rights era, from reformist movements of the classic era of the civil rights movement that uh, we, we think of as being led by Martin Luther King Jr., um, to the separatist movements such as invoked by the Black Panther Party and the Nation of Islam. All of these movements were swept under what the FBI called the Black Nationalist Hate Group, the Black Nationalist Hate Rubric of COINTELPRO, uh, whose purpose is quoted here from the FBI. The purpose of this new counterintelligence endeavor is to expose, disrupt, misdirect, discredit, or otherwise neutralize the activities of Black Nationalist hate type organizations and groupings, their leadership, spokesmen, membership, and supporters, and to counter their propensity for violence and civil disorder. And so again, remember that under this rubric, uh, Co FBI's COINTELPRO had a long campaign of harassing Martin Luther King Jr. 
who is now held up as, you know, a, a, as a very positive icon in, in the US. So those tactics that FBI that the FBI was using under this included old school wiretapping and mail opening, um, uh, infiltrating movements, but also using agent provocateur in order to incite violence between groups, particularly between the Black Panther Party and other allied groups at the time. So as we go through time to the more modern era in the, in the early 2000s, um, we know that those tactics continued and is covered extensively by Will Potter in his book, Green is the New Red, which I encourage you to read. Um, so these tactics have been used against environmental and animal rights movement uh, in an era that we now call the Green Scare. There, uh, you probably have heard of the Patriot Act growing out of uh, post 9-11 America, but there's also something called the Animal Enterprise Terrorism Act that makes, uh, that allows the government to charge activists with terrorism if they do some things such as filming farm operations. Uh, and for crimes that you might actually consider a crime when you probably don't think that filming farm operations is a crime, uh, these acts, the, the Animal Enterprise Terrorism Act and the Patriot Act uh, allows the government to charge animal and environmental activists and other activists with crimes that normally, um, that, that might still be crimes, but to, allows the government to charge harsher sentences to those crimes. In the last half decade, or maybe eight years now, we have seen the tactics become more extreme against environmental indigenous rights and Black Lives Matter movements. <clears throat> Most notably during the native led defense of Standing Rock in North Dakota from the construction of a pipeline, we saw the Dakota Access Pipeline Company hire a mercenary outfit called Tiger Swan that used both old school tactics such as infiltration and dog attacks like we saw during the civil rights movement, but also high-tech tactics such as social media monitoring, surveillance drones, and the use of cell site simulators, which intercept cell phone transmissions. Indeed, in this modern era, there is an increasing partnership between corporations and the state and social movement suppression. While in the past, the government may have been doing this surveillance in the interest of corporations, we now see companies doing surveillance on behalf of the government and corporations. Sarah Brain argues that companies have fewer restrictions on what kind of data they collect and surveil since they aren't bound by the necessity for warrants, for example. So during Standing Rock, we saw corporations doing the spying on the ground and from the air, and we saw them feed that information to local police. Social media surveillance has become big business with a near continuous stream of stories of how they are monitoring protected free speech activity, activity notably Black Lives Matter movements over the last seven or eight years. Uh, these social media surveillance companies market their services to police for this use explicitly as shown in this um, case study that was uh, developed by Geofedia, one such social media surveillance company for the Baltimore County Police. Geofedia marketed their product to law enforcement agencies for use in monitoring activists and protesters. And their product was subsequently used by Oakland and Baltimore law enforcement to monitor, identify, and in some cases arrest Black Lives Matter protesters out of the crowd. After this, Twitter and Instagram revoked Geofedia's access to their feeds. But this kind of process has been kind of a game of advocacy whack-a-mole. You have to find the company that's inappropriately monitoring speech on behalf of police and then ask social media platforms to revoke that access. And then another company turns up. Uh, so it was uh, a pleasure to be welcomed back to Canada to, to give a talk. Uh, I am Canadian. I grew up in Thunder Bay uh, and went to the University of Western Ontario for my undergrad. Um, and you know, have, have kept in touch with uh, the similar activism that's happening in Canada as, as in the US. And we do see that Canadian methods mirror the US uh, in terms of the type of government and corporations that are defending pipeline expansions. So what's happening, especially in Western Canada is very similar to that which happened in Standing Rock. Um, with a major exception that the pipelines in the Canadian West are being built on largely unceded territory. Uh, and this tests the concept of the open frontier of Canada's imperialism. There are many activists, many from, Canadi from Canada's First Nations that are opposing the constructions of pipelines based on climate change, protecting the land and waters and asserting control of their unceded land. But ca the Canadian government uses similar language as to the US government when focusing on indigenous activists. 
and uh, have used the terminology such as violent Aboriginal, Aboriginal extremists in referring to First Nations activists. The RCMP has been known to map out network, networks of First Nations protesters, for example, through Project, Project Sitka, which compiled a list of 89 protester profiles um, as posing a criminal threat. Um, after exhausting legal channels, First Nations protesters have, uh, have pursue, often pr end up pursuing blockades on their own land by building structures on pipeline paths, on pipeline, on the future paths of pipelines, such as by the Wet'suwet'en and Nostoten opposition to the coastal gas link pipeline and the Shoepham uh, uh, opposition to the Trans Mountain pipeline. Okay, I wanna pause after that introduction um, and I want to uh, just take note of the examples I, I use to, to illustrate the kind of government suppression, the kind of surveillance supported government suppression of social movements that we see happening. Uh, I did not cherry pick these examples. It is very typical that surveillance does not affect everyone equally. Um, so these examples represent the working class, African Americans, Native Americans and First Nations people. Um, and indeed, individuals who engage with social movements generally do so from discontent, discontent, and that is often driven from a lack of privilege, i.e. people fighting for their rights. The government is usually a stabilizing force and generally prefers the status quo and answering to those that benefit from the current state of things by construction. So it is worth the massive effort of surveillance by the government from on the ground infiltrators to mass surveillance to maintain the structures of society as they currently are despite the fact that they result in massive inequality. And so those who fight for change tend to be oppressed and tend to be marginalized. And in the US and in, and in Canada, that segment of the population is highly overrepresented by black and indigenous people and more generally people of color. So this is having difficulty changing slides. There we go. So this is the setting for my research. Um, and as uh, Ian said in the introduction, I did not come into this out of grad school uh, as you know when I graduated from from Brown University with my PhD I was a theoretical computer scientist uh, proving theorems um, and did that for a long time I you know was was a theory a theoretical computer science researcher for a long time and I did I was also engaged in some unrelated environmental activism and then when the Snowden disclosures came out um, and having had some history, some knowledge of the history that I just went over, um, I discovered the Civil Liberties Defense Center, um, which is a nonprofit law firm that provides legal support to uh, first uh, frontline communities, to, to activists, essentially. Um, and I started doing outreach, outreach with them through digital security help and guidance to, to activists, and I started doing a lot of, a lot of trainings for activists. And then I ended up doing a sabbatical at the Civil Liberties Defense Center to try to see how I could possibly switch my research over to supporting the needs of activists further. So I, I did some test research projects with them. And There's so a there hand up in the chat in the uh, attendee panel. Oh, are, are you happy to take a question right yeah, now? Yeah, sure. Sajin, go ahead. No, oh, maybe not. Maybe it was an accidental hand. Oh, it was an accidental hand. Okay. No problem. Thanks for letting me know. I can't see the hands go up. Uh, so I, for the in the remainder of this talk, I want to go over the the projects that came out of this the shift in my research and my partnership with the Civil Liberties Defense Center, um, and maybe give a little hint as to how one does this kind of research and what makes that research uh, possible or impossible. So I'm gonna talk about three projects with two collaborators who are sociologists and a bunch of lawyers, uh, one on police monitoring of social media, one on the long-term use of PGP or email encryption by lay people. And the third project, which is ongoing, which is on understanding activists' use of privacy enhancing technologies. Um, so police monitoring of social media, as I said in the introduction, is, is quite widespread. Um, and, and most recently, we saw that Data Miner is the latest abuser. It's a company that does social media monitoring on behalf of police as well as corporations. Um, and they, uh, it was uncovered that 
uh, data miner was explicitly monitoring George Floyd protests on behalf of law enforcement. But my project on the social media monitoring, the monitoring of social media by police started with this map, which is from the Brennan Center, which showed how widespread social media monitoring software is uh, amongst law enforcement agencies in the US. So each of these uh, little points on this Google map represents uh, an agency, a law enforcement agency that's spending at least $10,000 a year on social media monitoring software tool use. Um, and I was most curious by this little blue um, uh, point up in Oregon. This is Corvallis, Oregon. It's a town of 55,000 people uh, with a public university with over 20,000 students in it. Uh, and it has been rated multiple times as the safest town in America and the best college town in America. Uh, and so it was surprising to me that the Corvallis Police Department was spending $10,000 a year um, on digital stakeout, which is just one of many social media monitoring software products. And so uh, as my work with the Civil Liberties Defense Center, I focused on digital stakeout, um, partly because it was being used in Corvallis, but partly because it was one of um, uh, a few social media monitoring platforms represented in this map that was still being used. Um, uh, was still being subscribed to, subscribed to by police, uh, despite controversies. So uh, just to give you an example of what one such controversy looks like, the Oregon Department of Justice uh, had a trial run of digital stakeout, um, and an agent of the Oregon Department of Justice searched for Black Lives Matter as a hashtag through digital stakeout and discovered that the Oregon Department of Justice's director of civil rights and only black lawyer was tweeting support of Black Lives Matter. And as one example had this tweet, which if you are too young, uh, I will let you know that this is referencing a song lyric by the band Public Enemy. The DOJ agent wrote a memo describing the director's posts as anti-police um, and suggested that this should be uh, uh, looked into. Um, the offending agent, thankfully, was later found to be in violation of state law, the person who wrote this memo, not the person who made the tweet, uh, and the Oregon Department of Justice now has a policy of not surveilling social media. So in this setting, I, I embarked on trying to figure out uh, what uh, digital stakeouts monitoring of social media was like, and so I started by doing public records requests to law enforcement agencies. Uh, and this is the basic process for a public records request. So in, in the US and Canada, um, you can request a public agency provide you documents under some guidelines um, and usually start by asking them nicely by sending them a letter. And most of the time they will say no for some reason. Sometimes they'll say yes and you're lucky. And if they say no, then you CC a lawyer, you get some lawyer to, to allow you to use their name. Um, and they're still most likely to say no, but sometimes they'll say yes. Uh, and if they say no, but you know that there are documents there to uncover, um, then really your only um, path forward is to sue. And this is actually how a lot of news stories uh, happen from, from public records, that, that they actually end up having to sue public agencies in order to get the public records that are, that are due to them by, by, public, by public records laws. Uh, so I got very lucky with the Corvallis Police Department that they gave me a lot of very rich data of logs of searches that Digital Stakeout had set up for the Corvallis Police Department that covered an 18 month time period. Um, I wasn't lucky with any of the other law enforcement agencies and I could not figure out how to write a grant that asked the government for money in order to sue some other government agency. Um, let me know if you've had any luck with that. Um, but to use the data that I got from the Corvallis Police Department, I ended up in a meeting with the general counsel of my university, the inf information security officer, and the um, institutional review board to discuss liability and the, the, the path forward, which is not something I expected out of my research career um, when I first started. Um, but with this rich data that I got from the Corvallis Police Department, we were able to ask the following questions. One, how were the tweets identified for the police? And two, whose tweets were identified? Um, so the first question, uh, because the, the data was so rich and because the Twitter API is, um, you know, does provide a lot of rich data to you as well, uh, we were able to reverse engineer uh, how Digital Stakeout was picking one tweet out of many other tweets. Um, we were able to reverse engineer that and determine that Digital Stakeout was just using simple keyword searches. Uh, 
Um, and this is a word cloud of those keywords by the frequency that they appeared in the Corvallis Police Department data set uh, for a particular search that was labeled as a narcotics search. Uh, and when we first looked at the tweets, we were, you know, sifting through the tweets that we got from the Corvallis Police Department. Um, you know, we, we just couldn't help but notice that the tweets just seemed like very, a very poor quality in terms of being useful for law enforcement purposes. And so when you look at these words, sure, these words are all euphemisms for, uh, or many of these are euphemisms for, um, for drug products. Uh, a lot of them are marijuana related, which is interesting because the, the time period of the data that we got from the Corvallis Police Department was entirely after the legalization of marijuana in Oregon. Um, but as a result of you know, words that are just euphemisms being used for um, something that is labeled as a narcotic search, all we ended up with was a lot of tweets about the weather and about uh, little kids' birthday parties for some reason. I guess bowling is a, is a popular thing to do at little kids' birthday parties in Oregon. So we dug into the data further um, to determine whose tweets were identified. Uh, by manually coding the race and ethnicity of Corvallis tweeters in the data and uh, Corvallis tweeters that we sampled directly from Twitter to, to compare these. Um, and in that manual coding process, we did get a substantial level of agreement for inter-rater reliability. Um, and so first we can see that there are more white people that are picked up by digital stakeouts. So the, the first column is a column of just a sample of Corvallis tweeters. The second column is a sample, uh, or sorry, is the set of uh, tweeters whose tweets appear in the data set we got from, from um, the Corvallis Police Department. So you can see that there's, there's a higher proportion of uh, white people um, in the digital stakeout data. Um, but, this, but when I looked at this, you know, I saw the numbers, for example, of Black people appearing in, in these um, Twitter data sets. Uh, and this is a lot higher than the number of Black people in Corvallis. And it can be difficult to make a comparison here um, at least definitely not one statistically, because census categories of race are very different from uh, externally coded um, uh, race. Uh, but we can at least look at a high level and see that the, the fractions of um, the fraction of black people appearing in the Twitter data is a lot higher than the fraction of black people, people who identify as black within within Corvallis as one example. Uh, and this can be problematic um, because if you know more people of one segment of the population are using Twitter, in this case with geotags, um, and that is the data that is being used uh, to identify tweets for law enforcement um, by a social media monitoring company, uh, then they then that focuses undue attention on a certain segment of the population over others. Okay, so the second project that I wanna talk about is uh, long-term PGP use by lay people. Um, so PGP is for maybe the few of you who don't know in this particular audience, uh, PGP is uh, a method of uh, encrypting email in an end-to-end -end way. Um, and if you've ever used it outside of using something like ProtonMail, which has it sort of baked in, um, PGP is, is really kind of a pain in the ass to get set up. Uh, <laughs> however, back in 2013, when I was starting to do digital security trainings for, for groups of activists and their lawyers uh, in partnership with the, with the Civil Liberties Defense Center, um, PGP was, was really only one of two options for end-to-end -end communications uh, at the time that uh, you know, we were able, had any hope of getting people set up with, with OTR, um, thank you, Ian, uh, being the other option. Um, and we did have workshops for both OTR and PGP. However, PGP uh, is a big, uh, 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 sorry, email um, is something unavoidable by lawyers still to this day. And as well, many activists at the time were exclusively organizing over email. Um, and that's starting to change with, with people uh, uptaking other ways of communication um, other than email. All that is to say, back in 2013, I was training activists on how to use PGP email encryption. Uh, and from, you know, until 2017, by, by sort of middle of 2017, uh, we had trained approximately 300 activists and lawyers in 
in using PGP email encryption by having them use Thunderbird with the Enigmail uh, plugin. Uh, by mid-2017, we switched to training in, um, in other tools, first starting with Signal and then starting with Keybase and other sort of more plug and play end-to-end -end encrypting um, messengers. However, we had this big cohort of 300 people that we had trained. And something that we had noticed is that they actually were using PGP uh, successfully <laughs> to send encrypted messages. Um, and so, uh, it, I, I knew also that there were the, all these papers, the sequence of papers called Johnny Can't Encrypt. Johnny Can't Encrypt, PGP is terrible. Johnny Can't Encrypt, PGP is terrible. <laughs> and so I, you know, was looking at these papers and I'm like, you know, well, this isn't my experience with these, you know, these activists who, you know, they're, you know, don't have degrees in computer science and they're not necessarily techie people, but they are able to use PGP. Uh, and so we did a follow-up survey with those, um, with some of, with, the, uh, we sent a follow-up survey with, to those people that we had trained that we had contact information for, because a lot of our trainings were, you know, you know privacy preserving. I, I didn't need to know who I was training, and uh, and that was fine. Um, but we had a, about a hundred people that that we knew we had trained and we had their contact information for, and so we followed up to see if they were um, still using PGP and to try to understand why or what why they weren't using that PGP uh, anymore. Um, and so this research was only possible, this follow-up research was only possible because we do have that, uh, I did have those trust relationships with the research sub subjects. Uh, and so it allowed us to do um, the first long-term use study of PGP, the first in the wild study of PGP. Um, and, I, and I point this out because the previous studies of PGP use were almost entirely in the laboratory. So they had the form of, we bring people into a laboratory, we set them up with PGP and we see if they can, you know, successfully exchange keys and send an encrypted message in, you know, some brief time period, like 45 minutes to an hour. Um, and, you know, with no follow up in the long term. Um, and so both those things are, are very different setups from, from what we were studying. We were setting, sitting, set, uh, sitting down with activists. We were training them in PGP. This, these were mostly in-person training. Some of them were online. Um, we got them set up with PGP. And, an hour to an hour and a half, depending on the size of the group. Um, and then we were, you know, letting them go and we really didn't have much contact with them after that. Uh, and so our results really did counter that of all of the laboratory PGP use studies, um, the Johnny Cant and Crip papers. Uh, so we followed up with the activists uh, between uh, six and 40 months after they were trained and we didn't find any correlation with how long it had been since they were trained. And so six to 40 months after they were trained, half of those people that responded to our survey were still using PGP uh, and they were using it successfully. Uh, so that was sort of, you know, that was a big win for us. Uh, and I wanted to discover, well, you know, what led the people to keep using PGP versus not using PGP after that time. So what we did is uh, we borrowed a technique from, uh, political science and sociology to analyze our data. Uh, this table um, is, represents all, uh, the respondents to our survey, the 19 respondents to our survey that we used in analysis. Um, so each row represents uh, this number on the left, either three, one, or two respondents, um, and, the, and a code representing their responses to the survey. So um, from their survey responses, we determined what level of ease they had with using PGP uh, and, and coded in a dichotomous way, just as a binary number. We coded whether they were individually motivated to encrypt their communications. We coded whether they were had a motivation to protect a group of people, such as the people that they were organizing with. We coded whether or not they belonged to a group of people that were using secure communications. Um, which at the time of our survey sort of, you know, represented whether or not their group had moved on to using Signal, for example. And then we also encoded whether or not they were in a, uh, engaged in high risk or low risk activism. So uh, risk equals one representing high risk activism and risk equals zero representing low risk activism. Uh, and finally, you know, we were interested in this outcome of whether or not they were still encrypting their, their email. So zero represents they weren't still, they, they weren't continuing to use PGP. 
one represents they were continuing to use PGP. And this column here, or sorry, this row here uh, represents two people that had the same, the only two people in our survey respondents who had the same um, set of conditions, one of whom was continuing to encrypt and one of whom was not continuing to encrypt. Okay, so qualitative comparis comparative analysis essentially takes this a table of just describing um, responses uh, and performs Boolean minimization in order to summarize this table with Boolean formulas that are easier for the brain to think about than just looking at this table itself. So if we uh, do qualitative comparison comparative analysis and get these Boolean formulas, this is what we end up with. So let's look at these two uh, Boolean formulas. The top one uh, describes, summarizes from the table um, uh, who ended up, what conditions the people had who ended up continuing to use PGP EML encryption. So they uh, had an ease with the technology, which makes sense. Um, uh, and they were either individually motivated or they were engaged in low-risk activism. Okay, so that's that's that. This is a, a simple description of the people who we followed up on their PGP email encryption use. Um, that describes uh, uh, their the conditions that led to that, or the conditions that were correlated with with their continued use of PGP email encryption. Those who didn't continue to encrypt their email, so represented by not encryption. Um, have a more complicated explanation. And this is, uh, this is a pattern we see in, in the use of qualitative comparative analysis you know, across the board. There are many more ways to stop doing something than there are ways to continue doing something. Um, so those who didn't continue to encrypt, we see uh, they fall into one of three categories. So uh, one of these three categories, they either did not have, find it easy to use the PGP email encryption, and they belong to a community that were using secure communications, or they didn't find it easy, and they were engaged in high-risk activ activism, or they were not individually motivated, and they engaged in high-risk activism. Um, and so in these two formulas, the, the relationship with ease makes sense, right? If, if, if it's easy to do, you're more likely to continue. If, you, if it's not easy to do, you're not likely to continue. Uh, the relationship with uh, individual motivation also makes sense, right? If you're individually motivated, you're probably more likely to continue to um, uh, go through the effort of engaging with a privacy enhancing technology. If you're not individually motivated, you're less likely to. However, the um, correlation with risk is unfortunate. <laughs> okay, we found that the low risk activists were the ones who were continuing to use PGP email encryption, um, or there was lower risk activated was correlated with continued uh, use of PGP email encryption. And high risk activism appeared um, in the correlates for not using um, PGP email encryption. Um, and I, I hope this is obvious why this is unfortunate. I think most uh, secure, people advising on security, uh, you, know, you start with a, a threat model. And if, you're, if your threat is high, you're hoping that that person is going to undertake more effort in order to protect their communications. Um, so, uh, but you know, this, I, you know, as a caveat, this was a, a very small um, group of people that we were studying. Um, this was qualitative work to try to understand something and, and spur more research. Uh, and indeed, we are uh, looking at this um, uh, at this correlation with risk in a in a larger population um, uh, and not just activists, so that we can get a larger sample of people. Um, but we can think about why this might be true, right? So our, our lower risk activists may uh, be less risk averse generally. And so maybe they are less risk averse in activism as well as in their communications. So they, they're more protective of their communications and, they, uh, and for the same reason, being less risk averse, they're less likely to engage in high risk activism. Um, higher risk activists may just be avoiding technology altogether, right? They may be the kinds of people that just uh, um, meet in person and decide it's uh, not uh, worth the effort of doing something like PGP email encryption. Okay, 
So the, the last project that I want to talk about is one that uh, is, is currently ongoing. Um, we're currently uh, performing in-depth interviews with activists on their use of privacy enhancing technologies, and we've started analyzing that data. Um, the kinds of questions we're asking is, you know, what tools are working for people? Are, you know, do they use them? Are they using them in the long term? Or do they start using them and find out that it's, you know, too challenging to continue using them? Um, so we're trying to figure out what activist actual practices are uh, and where the gaps are in terms of the use of, of, of tools and the tools that they need, right? So if there are tools that they're using that don't provide that aren't privacy enhancing, can we can we figure out why and whether or not there's a technological gap there? Um, and this is work uh, as well jointly with a, um, a sociologist, Kelsey Kretschmer, uh, and she's asking questions about whether or not um, the ways in which people organize together changes how they engage with privacy enhancing technologies. So, for example, if if people there's aren't a, are organized, there's a question in the Q and A. If I can. Oh, great! Thank you. Um, oh, great. Yes, let me take this. So the question is, uh, did you find or ask those who stopped using PGP due to undertaking high risk activism, were they using other tech uh, or forms of encryption? Um, and so uh, we didn't ask this explicitly, but in open ended comments in the survey, they uh, some of the activists did say that they're, they were um, using Signal, for example, with their communities. Um, so that's why we do have that, that, uh, that hypothesis that maybe they were just moving off PGP email encryption or they found something easier to use. Um, but this is part of the reason why we are engaged now in this in-depth interview process, right? When you, when you put a survey out into the world, it's a fixed product and, and you can't change it after, after it's gone out. Um, whereas with, a, with an interview, you can these questions will come up as you're interviewing and you can change the interview accordingly. Thank you, Dave, for your question. Um, so, uh, so the, um, the interviews that we're engaging in, you know, we're also asking about the ways in which people are organizing. For example, are they organizing in a bureaucratic organization, you know, something um, like Sierra Club, for, for example, or are they organizing in a grassroots organization, for example, like Rising Tide America? Uh, and uh, my sociologist collaborator is very interested in understanding whether or not these different kinds of organizational ways that people are engaged in activism, whether or not that changes how those organizations adopt or don't adopt privacy enhancing technologies. Uh, there's very little, there's very little work done on how groups of people um, adopt uh, privacy enhancing technologies, except in, in business settings where there has been some work done. But that is a very different setting because then you have, you know, a boss saying, okay, now everybody has to use two-factor authentication, and, and that just happens, <laughs> which isn't something that you can do in a grassroots organization. Okay, so I, I want to move into a little bit of a conclusion. Um, these are these here are images of the battle in Seattle, uh, which may be uh, too long ago for many of you in the audience to remember, uh, but the battle in Seattle was a, a massive um, organized protest that happened in December of 1999 that shut down the meetings of the World Trade Organization at a time when there were a lot of protests against fair trade agreements that were that were spur, um, spawning up across the the world. Um, and and this and the, these protests were successful in shutting down the World Trade Organization meetings in Seattle. And largely they were successful because security was caught off guard and wasn't prepared for the sheer numbers of people that showed up for this protest. And something that I like to ask myself is, um, is whether or not you could have such a large planned protest successfully shut down an event like that, um, that goes against, uh, you know, when, there, when there's an event such as a meeting of the World Trade Organization that is going against the tide of interests of the, the majority of, of people in a population. That is, given that we have mass surveillance technologies, we have technologies that are able to, um, you know, know when such protests are being planned for, would we be able to have such a protest uh, without it being caught up by the mechanisms of mass surveillance today? Put another way, can people effectively dissent against the government if the government knows everything about them? Um, 
And so, you know, I, I've spent a lot of time on, on educating people um, and trying to educate individuals in terms of like what they can do to protect their communications uh, that led to those trainings, for example, the PGP trainings that I, I then took back to my, to my research career. Um, but I do, uh, I also teach a class called Communication Security and Social Movements, which I designed as sort of the ideal train the trainers <laughs> uh, for digital security. Um, you know, if I could have, uh, you know, people from social movements come and study with me for a, for a quarter, what could I teach them so that they could go out and protect their communities? Um, and, I, and I eventually developed that, the materials from that course into a textbook called Defend Dissent, which is freely available online um, at the link on the page there. Um, so this is a shameless plug for my textbook uh, to say that, so this is a textbook that goes over uh, cryptographic basics um, and has context for each of the, even for, you know, um, you know, basics such as key exchange, there's a, each chapter has a contextual story, mostly from social movements. Um, and I do sort of view this book as being, a, you know, it could be used as a digital security training for trainers manual. Um, but it's not, you know, it's crypto basics plus context plus uh, threat modeling plus what you can do, um, not written at, you know, the usual crypto level of, you know, a 300 or 400 level class, but it is written at a 100 level and intended for non-majors. So uh, my aim for this textbook to be accessible um, to anyone entering university or, you know, a senior high school student, for example. Um, I'm also excited to say that it's soon to be translated into Spanish over the course of the next six to nine months. Uh, I'm very excited about that to, to get it out into the world more. Um, I was also really happy to work with some great graphic designers uh, at our um, open Oregon State publication house that created for me lots of cool GIFs that explain um, how privacy can be obtained. For example, this one showing how a message is encrypted with layers of encryption to go through the Tor network. Um, and all of these cool gifts and the whole book itself is CC by NC. So you can use them in your talks and teaching. Um, and of course, I'm happy to hear uh, any comments on how it can be improved. Um, so I, I want to end here. So there is time for more questions. I want to give a shout out to my collaborators, Kelsey Kretschmer and Brett Burkhart in sociology at Oregon State University, and to my graduate student, uh, Alex LeKirk, uh, who is toward the end of her PhD now, um, and of course to the Civil Liberties Defense Center. Uh, I encourage you to support their work or other organizations like them that try to support the civil liberties um, and First Amendment free speech rights, free speech rights uh, of people both in the US and in Canada. Okay, I'm going to stop there. Okay, let's uh, thank Glencora. I'm the only one who's clapping she can hear. <laughs> okay, so if uh, you have questions, there's the Q&A box uh, over there. Uh, and I'll let uh, people start poking into that. Um, while we're waiting for that, uh, let me just uh, throw in with one. So in the example of the, uh, the, I forget what you called it when you took the, basically the truth table and you did the, the Boolean, um, minimization on it. So how, uh, like if you had a lot more data, it would seem to me that the implications wouldn't be so solid or they'd be fuzzy, like it would only be true 95% of the time or something like that. So in this technique, how, uh, how, how much fuzziness do you allow for? That's great. That's a great question. Um, the, there are sort of best practices for QCA users, the qualitative comparative analysis users, uh, that depends on the setting, but it, the method does allow for that fuzziness. So you can you can set. Um, I'm trying to remember the the two the two, the two fronts. There's coverage, and there's um, there's how much of your of your data in your table are you explaining with your formula, and then there is um, how how many of uh, the data that you're covering, are you correctly explaining, right? So you can, you're allowed to make mistakes and you're allowed to not, not explain in some cases. Um, and I think that the goals are something like 90, you know, can be up to 90% for coverage and up to 80% for, for, um, 
how much you're correctly explaining, but you can you can sort of shift that. Uh, it, it, ours, because it was such small data, um, we actually got uh, sort of perfect coverage and, and, and explanation except for that one case that contradicted itself, right? So of course we had two people who looked the same in terms of their survey results, but had different outcomes. One continued to encrypt and one didn't. So that we're not gonna be able to explain in a Boolean formula. Right, and if I could just um, hearken back to your previous life as an algorithms person, what is the complexity of that algorithm? It's, yeah, it's it's not great. <laughs> uh, I can't actually, I did, I, I spent a lot of time figuring out exactly what these algorithms are doing. Um, uh, it's not poly time solvable for the, the Boolean minimization, right, that's what if I, I remember. Um, uh, but they have, you know, heuristics that, you know, for small data, you can, you can solve this just fine. Um, uh, there's also all sorts of things, assumptions you can make about um, the cases. So in that Boolean table was not complete at all, right? It was, it was not covering every possible two to the five or six possible conditions, right? So there were, there were cases that I wasn't explaining. Um, and there's all sorts of uh, questions about, well, the cases that you're, that you don't have data for, are you allowed to predict a zero or one, or do you have to predict neither? You know, so like, what what is your Boolean formula allowed to do? Um, and there's been a lot of. It was really interesting to read sociology papers. There's been a lot of uh, debate about what the right thing to do is for those cases that you don't have data for. So this the the set of conditions for which you don't know an outcome from from your data. Um, uh, and I was starting to think, it was like, oh, this. There, there could be a spectrum of possible Boolean formulas that you output, um, and then you could try to, you know, use information from your domain to try to figure out which one of those are, is more, more, more likely to be explained. So there, was, there are some theoretical questions in there that would be interesting to dig into, but I have not yet. Maybe, maybe I I'll feel like proving a theorem after another year's break of not proving a theorem. <laughs> Very nice. Okay, so there's some questions in the Q&A now. So I'll yeah, you thank you. Those. So uh, the first question uh, or comment slash question is, I'm wondering if there are other venues for anti-suppression and anti-racist practices in computer science. Something I've been struggling with has been the use cases of especially machine learning to further economic disparities. So this has been really wonderful and informative. Thank you for your comment, Robert. Um, uh, there definitely are. Uh, and you know, your, your case of machine learning is a great one. Um, the, there's a conference that I'll point you to called FACT, F, uh, capital F, capital A, lowercase c, lowercase c, T for fairness, accountability, and transparency. And this grew out of um, largely looking at fairness and bias in, in machine learning and AI practices, but has gotten broader and, and looks more generally at computer technologies or, or sort of data science technologies generally, um, and, and analyzes that in terms of fairness uh, and, and bias, uh, and also suggests fixes for it. Um, so I encourage you to look at that conference as a good starting point. Um, if you do look up that conference, again, fairness, accountability, and transparency, uh, they have a website with further resources to, to other conferences where you can look for papers, workshops where you can look for papers, and you know, books that people have written on this. So thank you, Robert. Um, so a comment from Dave, none of the relevant practical current tool, tools, example signal, utilize metadata privacy, which is likely the most important for surveillance. I agree wholeheartedly. Let's develop some more tools for doing that. Um, I really was sad that Tor Messenger disappeared. Uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I totally agree. And again, this is uncovering places where um, uh, you know, where the technology isn't necessarily meeting the needs. Activists wouldn't necessarily uh, notice that that's not meeting their needs. Um, but in terms of uh, the gaps that um, are most pressing, uh, it has been lower on my list to um, handle metadata privacy than the fact that a lot of activists are still organizing over Google Drive, for example. Um, thank you for your comment, though. It's a great direction for research. 
Uh, Leah asks, I can see that one challenge in doing this type of work is recruiting users. Can you talk about your participant recruitment strategies, especially those involved in high risk activism? Absolutely. Um, the, uh, the, the only way I am able to recruit users from high risk groups um, is by having connections to those groups, either directly or indirectly. Uh, through the Civil Liberties Defense Center. So there's a there's a trust relationship already there. Um, uh, I, I'm struggling to remember the, the phrase for the type of, of research. It's like user um, participant, participatory, participatory research, I think is the phrase. Uh, maybe if there's a sociologist on the line, they can put that into the chat or Q&A to correct me if I got it wrong. Um, but participatory research is a way in which you get a research community, um, the community that you wish to study engaged in the research from the start. So you build a relationship with the community you wanted to, you're interested in, in asking questions about, um, and you ask them what their priorities are, and you help and, and you work with them to develop the research project from the start. Um, so that's another way to do it, but again, you know, requires making those individual connections, building those trust relationships. Uh, both of those things are really important. Um, so, you know, I think making sure we have representation from the communities where there's need is important um, and building relationships with those communities. Uh, a question from Dave, your historical examples are of national security surveillance groups by FBI feds, whereas your current examples are retail server surveillance by police departments using off the shelf commercial tech. Is this not a good thing or are activist groups currently surveilled by intelligence community, but due to lack of data, we don't know the exact extent. Um, yes, yeah, so the, the, we still know that activists are, are being surveilled by the FBI in the US, for example. The FBI is regularly engaging in knock and talks. This is how we know that the FBI is surveilling activist communities. So knock and talks are where the FBI literally goes to your door, knocks on the door and says, we just want to talk to you. Um, just to let you know, we're keeping an eye on the fact that you went to that protest last week. Um, or they go so far as to knock on the door of your employer and ask questions about you or they knock on the door of your parents and ask questions of them about you. Um, and a lot of these knock and talk strategies are, are to um, instill fear and to discourage people from engaging in, in activism. Um, so we do know that's happening, but yeah, that's really hard to study. <laughs> um, I, I haven't, haven't engaged in studying that. Okay. Um, Yes, thank you. Uh, Kat points out for metadata protection, you may want to look at uh, CWTCH switch, maybe? Is that how you would pronounce Quitch. it? Quitch. Great. Quitch. I, I'm going to look at that. I just opened it. Um, and now Rhymes with it. Butch. Okay, thank you. Um, I just need to switch back to my Zoom window now. Thank you for that link. Um, Participatory action research. Thank you, Jen Whitson. Um, I, I forgot the action part of participatory action research. Um, and I think that's all, all the questions so far. Happy to take another if there is one. Okay, well, we're just about out of time anyway. So if there's a last question, someone wants to jump in real fast. Okay, otherwise, let's uh, thank uh, Gwen Cora again. Thanks so much for having me. It was wonderful. And as usual, Gwen Cora will be uh, meeting with students next. And uh, uh, watch your email for future announcements of future talks in the Chris Speaker series on privacy. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. I'll see you in the student question room. <laughs>